turn with me to John chapter 14. We're going to read four verses, verse 1 to 4. Then we're going to do a little bit of exegetical work here upon this passage. But above all, we're going to seek God to comfort our hearts, to, uh, to remove our anxiety, to, to ease our trouble, because it is... It is painful. The scripture tells us that when a, when a congregation loses family members, and they are, we are a family in God. And you've heard me say this more than once before, that we all belong to our own nuclear biological family. And, and that's significant and, and that's important. But the, the only family that you will belong to that lasts forever is the church family. It's the church family. Jesus told us that in the resurrection, in the glorious paradise to come, We won't be given in marriage or have nuclear families or reproduce after the natural order of this world, but we will belong as brothers and sisters in Christ forever, forever. Some of you looking around thinking, wow, I got to... Oh, I got to get okay with that. Trust me, it's going to be amazing. We're all going to be glorified. So it's going to be incredible. We belong to this family. And when, when one of us undergoes that transition from this world to the next to be with Jesus, it leaves us here in a place sometimes of a feeling of loss, sometimes of a feeling of, of just kind of a, a dislocation. Something is out of place. Something is out of joint. You know, we turn to John 14 and we arrive at this moment in the ministry and the life of Jesus where he is at his final supper with his disciples. This is, this is part, of the, uh, part of the monologue of Christ that he issued his own apostles, his own deepest and dearest friends at his final supper, the night that he was betrayed, he met with them and he began to issue his very clear and very disturbing uh, announcement that he is about to leave them. He tells them, I'm going. And where I go, you can't follow. I'm, I'm going somewhere that you can't go with me. Now, we know that for the several years prior to the Last Supper, Jesus has explicitly and continually told his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be whipped, scourged, insulted, mocked. I'm going to be crucified and all of that to pay for the penalty for sins. But on the third day, I will rise. But for whatever reason, for whatever spiritual myopia or blindness there was in these disciples, they couldn't see it. They couldn't understand it. And now, on the eve of his death, he announces to them again, I'm going. And he can see, Jesus can perceive in his disciples that great trouble, great gloom, great anxiety has overcome them. And so John 14, verse 1 to 4, Jesus tries to ease their anxiety and calm their spirit. He says in verse 1, let's read these few verses together. It says, let not, Jesus' own words, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And will take you to myself and where I am, that where I am you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. Think about this three-year period. This three-year period, an estimate, uh, an assumption that this three years for these disciples, these apostles, has been riddled Riddled with glory. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be one of Jesus' most intimate confidants throughout these three years? You have watched your master command with the word of his mouth authority over death. At a word, the dead rise. You have watched your master at a word heal all sickness and disease. You know, one gospel narrator tells us that there was a time when Jesus eradicated sickness from many towns and villages entirely. Imagine being an eyewitness, standing off to the side and watching that. Incredible. These disciples have watched Jesus, the sound of his voice, still and calm and take authority over all the natural elements. Whether it's a a fig tree that should have had figs and didn't, he curses it, dries up and withers. Or whether it's out on the lake and the storm comes and the waves begin to smash against the ship. Jesus comes out, his nap has been disturbed, he's frustrated. He says, peace, be still. Incredible when you read it, and you read it in the Greek, that great story, and I know you'll be quick to do that later. 
It's incredible when you read it because the disciples in the boat, it says they are terrified, they are afraid. They think they're going to die. They go to Jesus and they say, hey, Jesus, you're going to wake up so at least you can die with us? And Jesus comes out, calls out to these elements, and they obey in a moment. No hesitation. No back chat. (laughs) The the winds and waves don't say, hey, who are you? They obey. Just like the inanimate world did in creation itself when God stood forth and said, let there be light. You know what the... The language in the, in the original Greek says that while when the storm was raging, they were afraid. And then when Jesus stood out and calmed it and there was peace and still, the text says they were greatly afraid. They were great. The Greek word is mega late. They were, they were mega afraid now. A moment ago, the threat was outside the boat, but now it's here in the boat with us. His name's Jesus. They saw all this. They witnessed this. And more than that... More than that, Jesus issued for them great authority. So so to be a confidant of Christ, to be a follower of Jesus, uh, an intimate disciple means not only that you get to be an eyewitness to all the glory of Jesus. John says in chapter 1 of his gospel, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son of God. We, We saw it. But more than that, Jesus commissioned them, oftentimes throughout this three year pilgrimage, to have this same authority. I mean, Luke chapter 10, it tells us of a, of a whole group that he sent out, 70 people, 70 disciples, 70 missionaries through all the towns and all the villages of a vast district to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel, to bring revival. And they were coming back. They had this incredible missionary journey. They came back to Jesus. You can read it later on in Luke's gospel. And they're rejoicing and partying and they're shouting and celebrating. They say, hey, Jesus, even the demons were subject to us in your name. Such was that revival for which we have no other extra biblical historical source. I wish we did. Jesus said, from my vantage point, where I stand, watching you 70 missionaries go out, flood the district with the gospel, heal all disease, cast out all demons. Jesus says, from where I stood, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Can you imagine being part of that? Well, here in John 14, Jesus has now told them it's all come to an end cataclysmic end, an end that will appear on the surface every bit despair, despondency, depression. Imagine being part of this group with Jesus. Swarms of devotees, flocks of crowds in the tens of thousands. I was reading this week, this is a side point, but I get a kick out of sometimes when I'm reading the Bible. I hope you do as well. And I was reading that story where Jesus is trying to get to Jairus' house to execute the healing miracle. And as he's going, the crowds are thronging him. You like that old English word? They throng him. You imagine him like a pinball being bashed about among these tens of thousands of, of devotees and, and, and followers. And this, this woman with the issue of blood creeps up behind him and reaches out, uh, saying to herself that if only she could make contact, if only she could make physical contact with the hem of his garment, she could be healed of a, of a physical debilitating illness that she'd had for over a decade. She reaches out, she touches the garment, she's healed. Jesus feels healing energy discharge out of his own body. He stops and says, who touched me? You know, what I found very comical is... Why the silence? What I mean is that hundreds of people are touching him. They're all clashing up and banging and hitting and knocking and they're all touching him. No one says a word. No one says, and then Peter says, "Uh, Jesus, what do you mean by this? And the woman comes forward and says, admits her guilt, thinking she'll be punished. She, She could have been stoned. A woman with an issue of blood making her presence public, being in public, touching other Jews of whom she was making them ceremonially unclean, and then touching a rabbi. She could have been stoned, but she, she owns it. Jesus says, your faith has healed you. 
Could you imagine being part of it? Could you imagine being part of this group where whenever you ran out of supplies, your master could just multiply fish sandwiches? And when tax time rolls around, well, don't worry about it. He's just going to send one of his followers fishing, a pull up a fish in the fish's mouth is enough currency to cover your tax. This is a devastating moment for a lot of reasons. Jesus, their beloved, the one that they love more than anyone else, said he's going. He's going to a place that he can't communicate with them and they can't follow and, and they're distraught. Jesus issues this promise of John 14, 1 to 4. Jesus speaks these words of comfort. Isn't that, I don't know about you, but for me, that's initially confronting. That Jesus seeks to confront his disciples. How remarkable is that? Right? How remarkable is that? That Jesus, knowing what he is about to go through, the torture, the mock trial, crown of thorns, whipping and scourging, mockery, beaten with rods, pounded about the face, beard torn out, nailed to a cross, hanging up for full shame and reproach of all Israel and bearing in his soul the infinite wrath of a holy God. On the night before all that takes place, he wants to comfort his disciples. To me, that's staggering. I don't know about you, but I know if I'm about to undergo some major ordeal, some painful ordeal, some terrifying and traumatic ordeal, the last thing on my mind, the last thing on my mind is to comfort someone else. I'm not, I'm not that much like Jesus. I find it incredible that in the throes of Jesus' most diabolical, horrific, deeper suffering and pain, he has the energy to say and do anything at all. I'm sure you've lived long enough to have undergone some kind of severe, painful crisis in your life. I won't go into the detail. I remember perhaps for me the most traumatic event was after playing too much rugby and having a fairly bad shoulder, having it surgically tightened and repaired to the point that I could barely lift my elbow any higher than what I'm demonstrating right now. And the surgeon said to me, well, we have to basically screw this thing down or your arm will be permanently dislocated and functionless. I said, go ahead, Doc, nail it down, and he did. Well, I didn't listen a whole lot to him, and I'm sure you're not surprised if you know me. He said, no more contact sports. I said, sure, that sounds wise. I was on a mission trip in the Philippines some years ago, and I, and I, had, a, I had a day spare. I had one night spare, and the next day I was meant to commence this pastor's seminar. I was going to run three days. I was going to speak, I don't know, for four or five hours a day, I just needed a night off and I had this night spare and I went online and I found this, I found a place I can go and just, just do some wrestling. I, I, li I like to wrestle and I found this club and I'm not going to get in there, burn some energy. Well, the, child, the arm's torn out of the socket. All the surgery undone. I, 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 if you did an MRI, you could see screws and bolts hanging everywhere and the pain was excruciating. Almost to the point where I could barely keep consciousness. Part of the ordeal is that there wasn't a hospital very nearby, and well, at least not how we would define hospital. Um, and it took 10 hours before I could even see a doctor. So I was in that state for 10 long, horrific hours. But here, here's the point. As, as I remember, this is not a, a sop story where you could you can sympathize with me. I've suffered too, not at all, no. But I remember in those hours... Doctors and nurses, not, not doctors so much, but nurses and people would come and ask me questions. And to speak at all was torture. I had to use all my mental energy to try and just cope with the horrific suffering. And then a nurse comes and says, are you allergic to anything? And you, what, you want to snap. Not you, you're so gracious, but me, I wouldn't just... I tell you what, that bothers me. When I go to the gospel... I see Jesus Christ under the lash of a whip, under the pounding and the beating and the nailing to a splintered Roman cross. Him using his energy to whisper prayers to the Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Forgive them. They know not what they do. If you've suffered pain, the kind of pain that contorts your view of reality, 
You've been there? It's staggering to see the grace, the mercy, the compassion, the love of this Jesus Christ. On the night that he was betrayed, by this point, Judas is gone. Possessed of Satan, he's gone to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus is with his other disciples, and he can see their forlorn visage. He says, don't be troubled. Don't be anxious. You believe in God? Believe also in me. I, I don't know about you, but I'm reading this, and I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the brakes just there. Why is he taking any time at all to worry about how they feel within around about 24 hours, he would have absorbed the infinite eternality of hell. Surely he has other things on his mind right now. But see the compassion and the love of Christ for you, for me, for us. I can't even imagine the mental burden that Christ was under at this point, but he opens to his apostles, his disciples, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And he goes into this discourse about where they should look for comfort. He wants them to be comforted. He doesn't want them to be stressed or anxious or troubled. And Jesus doesn't want that of any of us here today either. But life has a way of just getting into the mix of our heart, our mindset, poisoning us with anxiety, fear, and trouble. So from moving from that first consideration that, that Jesus stops and takes time and mental energy to comfort his disciples, he then shows them where their perspective ought to be. He encourages them. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Some of your translations may say something like, you believe in God as, a, as simply, a, a simply an indicative of reality. And other translations have it as an imperative, a command to, to believe in God. And the, the Greek's a little unclear. Both translations are fine. Both work well. He says, look to me. Look to me. Faith in Christ. Belief in Christ. The author, the finisher of our faith. He says to his disciples, I'm going, but I'm going for your benefit and for your glory. My going is my gift to you. I love the way Jesus communicates to his disciples that he in his own, in his own self, he assumes all the work and all the responsibility. Let's take a look in just these few verses of all of the things that Jesus either explicitly suggests or implicitly of the things that he will do for his followers. And by that, for you and I. Let's rack up this list. I will, Jesus said, I'll go to the cross. I will endure the hell. I will bear the reproach and become the curse. I will be buried. I will rise as first fruits of the resurrection. I will go to heaven ahead of you. I will go to prepare your place, your glory, your honor, reward, rule, and your residency. I'll do that. And then he says, and I'll be back. And I'll be back to take you to be with me forever. This promise is for the now. I read a number of commentators and, and exegetes on this text and seems to be something of a fetish to use these words of Christ as some kind of endorsement or, or bolstering for some eschatological view. Some love to use it to say, well, this is clearly the, this is the rapture. I'll come back to take you to, to be with, with me. And, and, and others like to use it for that, that, that uh, teleological return of Christ, the parousia, the, the end times, ultimate return where where Christ wraps up human history in final judgment. But, but those, those interpretations concern me. And let me just say initially, I, I have no doubt that in Jesus' words here, there is an eschatological component. That's a, it's a fancy multisyllabic word for just meaning end times. Jesus is coming back. He's returning bodily, gloriously, he's coming back. There's no doubt about that. That's, that's certainly part of all of our confession of faith. But I want to ask this. If, if that's all that Jesus really intends, what kind of a comfort is that to these guys? 
These guys lived 2,000 years ago and they all passed on about 2,000 years ago. How's that comforting for them? Hey guys, don't be stressed. Don't be worried. I'm going to go to my father's house, prepare the room for you. And then at the end of all the world, won't bother you. You're going to die before that and have no advantage. But I will come back eventually. I don't suspect that issues any real comfort. Now, as I said, I believe there's an eschatological component. But there's an immediate component. There's a here and now comfort in this. The promise is now. He says, I'm going to read it again. Verse 2, my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will take you to be with me, that where I am, you may be also. He wants his disciples to feel the comfort of this, that Jesus takes personal responsibility, not only for our salvation and the cleansing from our sin that he achieved in his blood shedding on the cross, but throughout our entire life. There, there's sometimes a way that the gospel is articulated that there's, there's almost an assumption that the gospel is really uh, about God saving us from our sins by sending Jesus to die on our behalf. And once you're saved, you're in, you're all good, you've got the check of approval, everything's fine. But Jesus says there's more to it than that. As Jesus sits on his throne in glory, it's where he is right now. As he reigns, takes responsibility sovereignly for every aspect of our life. Every hair of your head is numbered. Every day you live is counted by God. Every step you take is ordered of the Lord. And when it comes that time when you have finished your pilgrimage in this world, there is heavenly escort to the next. Jesus' promise has great validity for the here and now. So how do I envision this? How do I I expect this takes shape? Let me just explain. We are, of course, taking a break this morning from our series in angels, and there is great inference in Scripture. Jesus' own parabolic teaching that when the saints in the Lord, when they pass away, when they die, when their life here in this world comes to its natural end, Then the angels are sent, commissioned to be a convoy, to take that spirit, to go home to be with the Father in the immediate presence of Jesus Christ. One old philosopher, theologian, put it this way. I wish I knew his name. It came to me anonymously. He said this. He said, the one that has God... And everything else is no richer than the one that has just God. To have Christ as your possession, as your rule, sovereign, Lord, friend, glorious, glorious Savior. There's no substitute for every day of this life and especially for the final day of this life. Life. He says, he says, I'm going to glory to prepare your place. Some of the older English translations say, in my father's house, there are many mansions. It's not the best way to translate this word. It means rooms. Isn't it always insightful? Maybe not for you. It is for me. Always insightful when I read how the Bible depicts heaven as commentary on the culture of the day. You know, for us here in, uh, in East Texas, a house with many rooms is not abnormal at all. Most of our houses have many rooms. Just like in much the same way, there's nothing very abnormal about a buffet. Don't raise your hands. What would it have been like to live in this day and age? What would it have been like to live in this world, the Bible world, the New Testament world, where most houses in Israel had one room, just one. The room was the house. That's it. What would it have been like in Jesus' day if you lived and you ate, if you were faring well, you ate once a day. That's it, once a day. 
And the meal you eat might be at best a few snatches of bread and a mouthful of fish, and that's about it. So when Jesus communicates to his own disciples, his own followers, when he tells them heaven is going to be a place where there is limitless rooms, it's my Father's house. And you all get your very own, your very own room. And the room itself, where we're not, we're not given license in Scripture to try and picture it, to understand it, to try and depict it mentally, but just to realize what a glorious thing that must have been. And then heaven is so often depicted as a, a banquet, a banquet where you can eat all you like, whatever you like, as much as you like. Calories don't count in heaven. That's called good news. But what's amazing about this is Jesus says to them, don't be troubled, don't be anxious. I'm going to prepare a place. I'm going to prepare a place. Now what on earth could that mean? Is it, is it such that, that on the night of Jesus' last supper before he was crucified, heaven was a, was a ramble, a mess, a disorganized pile of nothingness and Jesus had to quickly make his way up there before any of his followers died and, and prepare the place? Is that what Jesus is indicating? Of course not. That's silly. Heaven's perfect. But Jesus is saying that for the believer, for the true believer, for the true believer, heaven could never be heaven without Christ there. The best part of heaven is that it is, as I said just a moment ago, it is immediate enjoyment of the personal presence of Christ. That's the glory of it. He says, I'm going to heaven right now to make it heaven for you. To make it heaven for you. David says in his psalm, where can I go from your spirit, O Lord? If I go up to the heavens, behold, you're there. But if I make my bed in the depth of hell, behold, you are there. Here is the truth, friend. Wherever you go with Jesus is heaven. Wherever you go. Whatever you go through, whatever struggle you have to endure, whatever pain there is, suffering, loss, turmoil, Jesus' admonition to you and I is do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm going to my Father's house where I will ready a place for you. The last concern we have to make here this morning as we look to close out our discussion around this great few verses, we saw that the promise is for now. It's not only for some end times, doomsday, final historic moment of human history. It's for now. Jesus gives his angels charge. Gives his angels charge over us. That when it comes our time to pass from this world, we are escorted. I love the language that Jesus gives in Luke 16. He says that the angels carried him. How about that? (laughs) How about that? They carried him. They they picked him up and wished him to glory, to be with Jesus, who has been preparing heaven. But our last concern, as I said, we'll visit right now is the promise is for everyone who obeys the single opening injunction The single opening injunction. I'm going to read John 12, verse 44 to 46. Just three verses and we'll close out with this. John 12, 44 to 46. It says, And Jesus cried out and said, Now just just pause for a moment. When you read your Bible, which I know you do, And you come across these moments. Do you see Jesus screaming this? Or do you see holy, patient, stoic Jesus, arms pressed across his chest? I want you to see him screeching this. And I want you to hear Jesus saying this to you and I here this morning. Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, 
so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. He screams it out. Whoever, whoever. I love that word because, friend, I'm included in whoever. That's me. And I want to receive Christ. I want to believe in Jesus. I, I don't want my heart to be troubled. I don't want to be anxious about death, about departure, about the world to come. I don't want to be afraid or troubled by that. Jesus says, believe. Have you believed in Christ today? Have you received Christ? And if you have, then you've believed in the one that sent Christ. That is his Father. If you've seen Christ with the eye of faith, then you've seen God. If you have received Christ, then He is your eternal possession. So don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, Jesus said. Believe also in me. Would you bow your head and close your eyes here this morning? We look to close our time together with a word of prayer. There are troubled hearts here today for many and varied reasons. People going through great trauma in their life, People suffering great loss, some on the verge or the brink of bankruptcy, others struggling with illness or doctor's diagnoses. There's great trouble. Jesus said, fear not. Fear not. You know, I believe as we bow our head and close our eyes to pray, let me just offer this, this comfort of Christ to us. I, I believe one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture is Jesus' own Words, he said, fear not, little flock. For it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. This is the hope we hold to. We don't bury our head in the sand and ignore the reality of death and suffering and pain and sorrow. We don't let our hearts be troubled. We believe in God. We receive Christ as our Lord, as our Savior, as our comfort and our peace. And he has gone on. This Christ has gone to glory, to his Father's house, to prepare a place for us, to ready it by his own presence. And if he is gone, then he will come, and he will take you to be with himself, that you may also be where he is. Many of you know how John 14 precedes. Philip, perhaps at times the most honest disciple, says, we don't know the way. <laughs> what, are you, what are you talking about, Jesus? We don't know. We don't know where you're going. How can we have the map? We have no idea. We can't, we can't even type in the GPS coordinates in our Google Maps. We don't know where you're going. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the comfort that comes in this incredible moment in Jesus' life. Many of us are weighed down today by trouble, by sadness, by sorrow. There's nothing necessarily sinful about that. There's nothing essentially wrong with that. But we do have to open our hearts to receive the comfort of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He told us not to let our hearts be troubled. Father, because our Christ has gone ahead of us. Father, He's gone to be with you. To prepare our place. And he will return to take us to be with him. We thank you for Jesus. I pray, Father, right now, under the sound of my voice, if there are any here right now or listening through the, the live stream or whatever the case may be, and they have yet to receive Christ as their glorious salvation, will they right now open their hearts to receive him, to believe on his name, and to know that he is their savior and comfort as well. We pray, Lord God, that your blessedness would be upon your word and spirit would brood over our hearts, sealing this truth to us. May it bear fruit in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 